I'm gonna break one of the fundamental rules of YouTube fitness, which is do not speak ill of the squat or deadlift. That is right up there with don't talk about politics in the YouTube handbook. So if you could all just pat me on the back for being so brave in the comments, that would be ideal. Having said that, I'm only gonna talk about my experience with those exercises and talk about why after many years of back and forth, I've now chosen to stop doing them for good. But I do know that my personal experience isn't necessarily indicative of other people, so I'm not here to try and convince you not to squat and deadlift, otherwise I would have titled this video something like stop doing these two exercises now. Probably got quite a few more views. I only want to share my experience, talk a little bit about the mechanics of the exercises and open your mind to some other possibilities. That last bit of the sentence sounded like I'm about to start a cult. I'm not. Anyway, enough preamble, let's get into it. Yo people, let me just do a quick thank you and a shout out to Legend London for sponsoring this video. I am currently wearing some of their garments, obviously. I look tiny, mate, that's because it's a super wide angle clip and also because I'm tiny. Anyway, I am into more of the kind of casual, understated, oversized, minimal branding, low effort type clothes. And if you are too, then you should probably buy this t-shirt, mate, because it's a sick, sick, casual, Plain, who doesn't need a plain black tee, mate? They do it in white as well. There's loads of other cool stuff, not just plain tees. Uh, they actually did a recent drop, which I haven't got my hands on yet, but will do. I'll put up some pictures of me wearing other clothes from them, so I don't have to do a full like fashion show slash catwalk in my video. Anyway, check them out. If you're a human and you wear clothes, then well, they sell clothes, so that's just a match made in heaven. Um, you can use my discount code as well. I think it'll only get you 1% off, which isn't a great saving to be fair, but it does reflect well on me, so that's ideal and I, I would appreciate that also. Anyway, thanks to Legend London again. Thanks to all you for uh, well, watching through me ads and stuff like that, appreciate it. All right, let's go to the actual video. I did put chapters in the video so that you can skip around and you don't have to just fucking watch me mumble for a long time. For a lot of my late 20s, I would go through intermittent periods of waking up and just feeling quite stiff, particularly my lower back. When it was bad, I literally would struggle to put my socks on, which is obviously a less than ideal situation. I was the opposite of supple, and initially I just thought that it was a bit of tightness from all the lifting, and so I put quite a bit of time into stretching. I was thinking, lower back feels tight, therefore stretch lower back, therefore should feel less tight. That was the logic. However, it did not help whatsoever. Regardless of how much corrective stretching I did, it actually bore no correlation to how tight and immobile I felt when waking up in the morning. Eventually, I realized that this wasn't just tightness or stiffness, and it certainly wasn't a flexibility issue. It was actually the accumulation of lots of minor injury that I wasn't actually registering as injury because it wasn't painful as such. What it did correlate with was periods of my training when I was doing a lot of squatting and or deadlifting. Now aside from that, there is also actual injury that does give you pain and discomfort. Luckily, I've never had anything major, but the amount of times that I've had to take between two weeks and two months off any exercises that involve lower back tension is probably between maybe five and 10. And considering that aside from that, in my whole 15, 16 years of lifting, I've only ever really had one other notable injury. That is really saying something. So eventually, after years and years of banging my head against the wall and being too dumb to notice the pattern or just too stubborn to accept it, I stopped squatting and deadlifting altogether. And guess what? Now I can put socks on. I've got some on now. It was easy, right? Not doing those two exercises did more for my mobility than any amount of corrective stretching ever has. And that was almost immediate. Now it's pretty early to say, but I'm also quite confident that the lower back injuries are a thing of the past as well. Now a lot of you are probably thinking you shouldn't be feeling like that and getting hurt if you're doing them right. And so you must have been doing them wrong. You're probably right. I'm sure you could critique my form and find errors, but it certainly wasn't for a lack of trying. I have truly tested my patience and mean back to the drawing board many times. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably will have seen a lot of stories over the years of a picture of a deadlift platform or a bar in Iraq and the caption, relearning the deadlift or relearning the squat. I really did try. And honestly, although it's not perfect, I actually don't think my form is bad. I've certainly seen a lot worse in people who seem to get on fine with those exercises without getting injured. For pretty much everything you do in life, there's a risk benefit calculation. What's the risk? What's the benefit? 
and can I get the same benefit elsewhere with less risk? So to answer those, let's just look at what these exercises actually do. We can't just lump these exercises into one and talk about them together, so we will make some distinctions, but first let's just talk about these similarities. Both are complex compound movements involving many synergistic components, and both are quite efficient movements in terms of force production, meaning you can shift quite a lot of weight relative to other exercises. So the complex nature of the movements together with the heavy weight is why these exercises take the most toll on your body in terms of fatigue, accumulation, and subsequent recovery. It's also why form can be harder to master and therefore injuries can be more common. Now let's separate these out and talk about them from a hypertrophy perspective. I actually think the squat has far more utility as a muscle building exercise than the deadlift. Essentially it's just a leg press type movement with lots of core bracing. So there's hip extension and knee extension via the glutes and quads, then some slight plantar flexion at the ankle but as you're primarily driving through heels it's not a particularly engaging contraction for the calves. There's also some adductor and hamstring involvement as synergists but since it's only a relatively short contraction probably doesn't have too much hypertrophic benefit for those muscles. From the waist up you're really just bracing your core to keep a stable posture so it's your lower back muscles and abdominals that are undergoing an isometric contraction and whilst that might not sound particularly taxing it certainly can be considering the weight to body weight ratio of the squat typically. So for your prime movers your glutes and quads are using a high load through a good range of motion with a resistance curve that means the rep is hardest when those muscles are at their most stretched position. So you're ticking all the boxes for hypertrophy. However, as with all exercises, there are a few minor drawbacks. It's a complicated exercise to master when you consider everything from foot placement to bar path, which means a lot of people, probably myself included, never actually do master it, which at best makes it a less efficient movement for force reduction, and at worst makes it an injury risk. Most people can overcome this with some perseverance, it just might be a bigger time commitment. To get the most out of the exercise, you do need a certain degree of mobility, which a lot of people lack. Now, technically, this is true of all exercises, but more detrimental with a squat, where a lack of mobility doesn't just result in a decreased range of motion, but usually in compensating with form adaptations. Again, not a deal breaker because mobility can be improved, but just something to be aware of. It's quite a high fatigue cost, both acutely in terms of intra-workout recovery and also over the course of your training week in terms of recovery needed between workouts. Again, this can be managed with rest times and appropriate volume and intensity distribution. Finally, and this is part conjecture, but something that I've wondered about a lot, does all the core bracing and all of that effort going into stabilizing the weight and keeping form correct actually detract from the press? Of course, you can't just look at it that simply because you do actually need to develop stabilizer muscles, so that is a benefit in that sense, but we need to factor in this interference when looking at the pros and cons of the exercise overall. Now for me, none of the above are deal breakers, all of them can be managed or accounted for. So if you want to build your leg size overall, in particular glutes and quads, then the barbell back squat is certainly a good choice, maybe one of the best choices. That's why I tried to do it for so long. The only thing that really stopped me was the aforementioned injuries, which I just continually seem to sustain. That being said, although it's a good choice of exercise for most people, it's certainly not the only choice and it's certainly not absolutely necessary to include if you are like me and find yourself quite injury prone when squatting or if you feel quite mechanically unsuited to squatting you find it quite uncomfortable or if you just don't enjoy squatting and choose not to you are also allowed to just choose not to without an excuse personally I like to include two leg press movements in my training which aren't always the same two choices but my preferred tend to be a traditional plate loaded leg press and a Bulgarian split squat I think these go well together because you're covering bases and they somewhat counteract each other's drawbacks one is a double leg one is unilateral one won't do much for your stabilizers, the other will. One involves a complicated setup that can take some time to get right, and the other you can just jump on and do your set, etc, etc. Now, all leg presses are not created equal. The one in my gym just happens to be a really comfortable movement, but if it wasn't, then I'd probably choose a different double leg press movement, like maybe a pendulum squat or a hack squat. To summarize, the barbell back squat is a great choice of exercise for leg development, but it's certainly not essential. There are plenty of other options that are at least as good, and maybe some that are better. The deadlift is different again not essential but if we're talking hypertrophy I don't even think it's that good of an exercise but I suppose that depends on the context Let's talk about it like we did the squat anyway. I will talk about the sumo deadlift because that's the one I have experience with. I have tried conventional but I seem to be even worse at those. As with the squat we have hip extension and knee extension although the wider stance means much less range of motion. But now we also have hip hinging going on to bring the spine from its starting position to an upright position at the top of the rep. Traps are also contracting isometrically as are your lats and other back muscles to some degree. You also have your grip to contend with so there's a lot going on. Prime movers for the sumo deadlift are your glutes, quads and erect 
factors, but there's also some hamstring involvement in assisting the hip extension part of the movement. And although the mid and upper back muscles are contracting isometrically, it is quite a strong contraction due to the sheer amount of weight that you're using. So if you break down the movement into its component parts, you'll see that it's made up of three relatively short ranges of motion. The hip and knee extension are substantially lower than in leg press type movements like the squat, although you do have to mention the external rotation of the hip, which will engage the glutes more in the press. And since you start the sumo deadlift in a fairly upright position, the actual hip hinge part of the movement is also quite minimal. Of course, it's not all about range of motion, and one thing that certainly works to offset that with the deadlift is the amount of weight that you're able to move. When you think about the resistance curve, really the whole point of a sumo deadlift setup, the wide stance and bringing your hips as close to the bar as you can, is to cut out the hardest part of the rep, i.e. the bottom part. Anyway, I don't want to get too bogged down in technicalities, so let's just summarize. As with any other exercises, there are drawbacks to the deadlift, but one thing that you do get with the deadlift that you can't really find anywhere else in your training is the sheer force production that allows you to shift weight that you really can't with other exercises. So it comes down to the fact that there are multiple factors that influence hypertrophy, and whilst the deadlift doesn't score well in some areas, it scores very well in others. There are better exercises for each of the prime movers involved in the deadlift however because it works so many muscle groups together you couldn't really swap the deadlift out for one other exercise you would have to replace it with multiple movements so should you include deadlifts well if you enjoy deadlifts or if you don't feel like they negatively impact the rest of your training whether that's just general fatigue cost or actual injuries or if you want to work a lot of muscle groups in a short period of time then yeah for me, although I do actually enjoy deadlifting, I just feel like they impact the rest of my training too much. I do have the free time to replace them with other combinations of exercises. And I'm also aware that having lifted for 15 plus years, the accumulation of even minor injuries over time could add up to some real wear and tear. So I'm also thinking about longevity. For my primary hip extension movement, I like hip thrusts and my leg extension happens to be quite comfortable for those. And for my hip hinge movement, I prefer RDLs supplemented with some hyper extensions. Now, I have talked about why in the past, so instead of just repeating myself, I will just link that video below. At the end of the day, you have to realize that fitness is like anything else. People will attach their identity to certain ways of doing things. Somebody might be the keto guy, somebody might be the deadlift guy. You might think I'm the not deadlifting guy, but I'm not trying to be my attitude to whether you actually deadlift or squat or not. It's true indifference, right? I just choose not to personally because I believe that I can get the same benefit with less risk. But of course, weigh it up and choose for yourself. See you later. Jordy Lenny is my hero.